Without further ado, let's welcome to the stage Lisa Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. I see some friends here. And uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to actually attend the sessions today because I've always gotten so much out of the state of reform, whether it was here or at SeaTac. But in, in true form, I procrastinated and wrote my speech today. So here I am. Uh, thank you all for being here. And uh, I look forward to um, maybe hearing some of your thoughts as we go forward. A special thanks to DJ and Kariana for putting this on, bringing people together. It's always been informative. It's been a great opportunity for people to network and a way to just stay in touch and sort of check in with people who are caring about the same issues you are but coming at it from different organizations or perspectives. I wanted to talk a little bit today about what I've learned about healthcare policy, living and working here uh, in a variety of settings for about 30 years. And my sincere hope is it doesn't take us 30 more years to make progress on some of the issues that we know we have in front of us and the challenges that we know we face. And I'd also like to reflect a little bit, and I see some of my former colleagues here, uh, on what we've accomplished in Washington State and the lessons or implications of that for our Congress and federal policy. And my perspective is shaped by being an economist which sometimes frustrates people because they'll ask me a question and I'll say on the one hand and on the other hand. Uh, but that is my perspective. And my experience, of course, as a legislator in the House and in the Senate, in the minority and in the majority for 20 years. Uh, I wasn't in the majority for 20 years. I was in the legislature for 20 years. And of course, we know the majority was better in terms of setting policy, but you don't always get what you want, you just get to help set the agenda. I also served on the Empire Health Board and the Washington Health Alliance Board that originally started out as the Puget Sound Alliance. And I was also reflecting on the 2006 Governor Chris Gregoire Blue Ribbon Commission on Healthcare that among others had uh, Secretary of Health Mary Selecki, Insurance Commissioner Mike Kreidler, uh, Speaker Chop, Representative Cody, Senator Parlett, uh, Senator Flug. So uh, people that stayed involved in healthcare policy and had a big impact on what happened in our state for a long period of time. And then I went to WSU and my experience as the chancellor of the health science campus. And I know that my successor, Dr. DeWald, also shared some thoughts with you today. And then finally, what's had the biggest impact on my thinking over the last year during this period of time where I have been a candidate for Congress in the 5th Congressional District, which I'm sure most of you know, but maybe a few people don't, is the 10 counties of Eastern Washington and it's bigger than the Netherlands. So when I look back on that agenda from the Blue Ribbon Commission of 2006, and I look at the agenda for this conference today, I'm uh, sorry to report that we're still grappling with a lot of the same issues that we were then. Uh, purchasing to improve quality, prevention and management of chronic illness, realizing the potential of health IT without sacrificing patient privacy. In particular, working with community organizations, something we particularly pride ourselves on here in Spokane, to deliver results to families whose healthcare challenges are intertwined with other societal problems, such as hunger and homelessness, uh, addiction, trauma, discrimination, uh, insufficient accommodation for disabilities or accessibility to services in rural areas or other barriers. And uh, as I think this through, um, we uh, are still grappling with those issues. And what I would put at the bottom of that list, number five, is sort of cost, cost, costs. 
And that really rings home to me after the experiences I've had over the last year. Because I'd like to tell you a little bit about what it boils down for me uh, with regard to the people that we have collectively served or that we may view as our clients, our customers, our patients, or our voters. And this will come to you after a year of town halls that I have held in Republic and Newport and Colville, Deer Park, Dayton, Pullman, Walla Walla, Cheney, Reardon, Spokane Valley, and Liberty Lake. And after knocking on doors in East Central neighborhood here, the West Central neighborhood, um, just last weekend in Hilliard, our more economically challenged neighborhoods, but also our up and coming neighborhoods like the Perry neighborhood and the Garland district in Spokane, and in our more uh, economically well-off neighborhoods like the South Hill and Rockwood and Mead and Five Mile. And I've also had numerous meetings with business people from uh, pharmacists in Northeast Washington to coffee shops and brew pubs to uh, CEOs of construction companies and manufacturing companies here in Eastern Washington. And here are the results of that one year survey. Um, very few people have concerns about the quality of their health care. I think you know that. Uh, we have options and, and possibilities that surpass none. And the one major exception to that is with respect to behavioral health and the frustration of not being able to access services for counseling, uh, mental health services, addiction, treatment, et cetera. And I have had um, too many occasions where parents have come up to me after a candidate forum or a town hall and shared their own personal story of a child lost to addiction and um, knowing that we as a society could do more in that area. Second, nearly everyone from the top of the South Hill to the neighborhood uh, nearby in West Central feels healthcare insecurity for someone in their family, if not for themselves, and is worried about the out-of-pocket costs of prescription drugs, of rising premiums. Uh, people shared stories with me about the cost of their insulin or the shortage of EpiPens in Northeast Washington. And so the, 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 the lack of functionality of our prescription drug system is definitely affecting people across across the system. And of course the fragmentation, paperwork, cost, what appears to providers and patients as interference in their, in their healthcare decisions, that is universally criticized. And uh, I know these are not easy problems to solve, but I have confidence that if we uh, work together and are guided by evidence and data and uh, by uh, sound principles of both healthcare principles and economic principles that we can actually make a lot of progress. The principles, the goals that, that uh, motivate me as I evaluate any policy proposals, number one, of course, easy to say, hard to accomplish, but nobody is left out. There's just no moral or economic sense to not be moving towards universal care at all times. And that's how we should judge both federal and state policies. Second, again, easier to say than to solve, but no family or business should face financial ruin because of a chronic health care condition or a tragic uh, contraction of a, of a disease or an accident. Um, and on the other hand, the economist in me says, and we all have to participate in sharing the responsibility of, of funding that system as well. And then finally, we need to use public health principles and public policy at all times to be analyzing and trying to reduce the disparities in our healthcare system, especially those that are still there and persist by ethnicity and zip code and in rural, between rural and urban areas. So collectively, that's a pretty tall order, but the good news, I think, is we've made progress, and there are some state and some organizational stories to learn from. 
And I think we know a lot about how to achieve these goals at a programmatic level, uh, from a public health perspective. But we are failing, and I would say we are principally failing in our political system itself. And so having spent considerable time in that space between politics and public policy, I thought I'd make a few observations about that, just a few quick observations, and then tell you what I'd like to work on should I have the enormous privilege to be able to serve in the next Congress. Number one, kind of my mantra when I was in the legislature was, and with respect to both members and stakeholder groups, was it's not enough to be right, you've gotta have the votes. And that is clearly still the case. It's not enough to be right. We have to bring enough people together and convince enough policymakers that, uh, to, to get these policies passed or implemented into law and into budget. And we've either, we've either gotta get enough votes to change the laws and the rules, or we have to change the policymakers and then take another run at it to change the laws and the rules. And second, the most sustainable changes that we make in healthcare or almost any other major policy area, education, the environment, just about anything we're talking about, happen when we have good bipartisan work happening. And that can be brought about by good leadership with narrow majorities, it can be brought about by divided government. Uh, one party control, I'm sure some of my friend, former friends at the legislature won't wanna hear this, but one party control at the state or the federal level is not usually the most fertile ground for making good sustainable policy that you're going to be able to build on over time. And as a footnote, I think that we in Washington State had those periods of time. We've had good leadership, we've had narrow majorities, we've had divided government, and we've gotten some, some we've made some good progress in expanding coverage. In We were early, in 1993, I voted for uh, protecting people with pre-existing conditions. Of course, there were votes a couple years later to change that, but uh, we've taken advantage of federal opportunities. We've worked closely with our federal delegation in order to make sure that federal policies were things that we could partner with. Uh, and I think comparing our experience to our neighbors next door in Idaho, where they are still struggling with a voter initiative to actually expand Medicaid, uh, there's a clear contrast there in some of the healthcare outcomes that have occurred because we made those decisions to expand uh, the children's health program to the maximum extent possible to start to break down the barriers between behavioral health and physical health, et cetera. Uh, third conclusion for me is that big system transformation blueprints are great and inspirational, but successful policy change is reform, not revolution. As much as, a, as appealing as it would be to think that we could tear down our entire tax structure and start all over, or our entire economic uh, healthcare system and start all over, that isn't how the change happens. We take what we've got right now and we improve it, knowing that improvements often involve balancing interests and, and possibly addressing people that will be better off and worse off, but that's the way we, we get the system to be better overall. And I would say that the same thing goes to counter-revolution. And repeal and replace has proven to be a, a useful political slogan, but not good policy. It's not moved us forward in healthcare and the areas we wanna make progress. Fourth, I learned that you make more progress when you reach across the stakeholder aisle as well as the political aisle. And I recall we made progress in saving prescription drug costs and taxpayer dollars in Washington State when we brought physicians and patient groups and pharmaceutical companies uh, to engage in the conversation about when under what circumstances it would be appropriate to prescribe generic drugs uh, for people on Medicaid with behavioral health 
uh, challenges. And we potentially at some point could have had the votes just to write the policy without the input from various stakeholder groups, but I think it's, it's more likely to survive and be a stronger policy if you involve the groups that are affected. I think we made progress on mental health parity when at the time group health broke away from the insurance coalition and said, let's talk about if this is gonna happen, how this is going to happen. And I think we move forward at that point in time. So stakeholders may get engaged for the good of the order. They may get engaged because it's in their self-interest. They may get engaged because they see the writing on the, on the wall and that policy's coming down, so they better be there at the table to help see what happens. But nevertheless, you get more productive uh, results when you do have that uh, engagement. And then finally for me, using economic analysis, cost benefit analysis, really studying things, it's kind of wonky and geeky, but you actually get better results if you don't just assume that something that sounds good is gonna get you good results, but you actually try to evaluate it. And I learned that uh, particularly on my time in service as a board member to the Empire Health Foundation and really appreciated the way that we would uh, not just fund what we thought sounded good, but we would work very hard to measure its impact and to see if it could be scaled up and still have the same kinds of results. So scratch cooking in schools sounds like a great win-win. Um, engage local food and farmers, uh, uh, create freshly prepared meals for kids, include nutritional education for families, and it is in fact a good, a good policy, but we had to measure whether the results were really helping with respect to both uh, health outcomes and educational outcomes. And as it turns out, it was, but not as well in some, some neighborhoods and demographics as in others. And so then you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out what, what really caused those differences. And for me, that was some of the most rewarding work I did and looking out here with some of you in the legislature is when we got to the bottom of a statewide formula that didn't really work very well for Eastern Washington, whether it was childcare provider rates or or anything else, hospital reimbursements, and we tried to figure out a fair way to make it work, but I could, I could represent and stand up for the people I represented, as well as look at the bigger picture and, and um, see the interests of others and see that, that we came out with something where everyone could walk away and feel that we had improved the situation. Of course, that didn't always happen. So, if I have the privilege of serving in Congress, I just have to tell you, I think that there will be new, new leadership in the 116th Congress. And I'm just gonna come right out and say that I'm not impressed with the results of the 115th Congress when it comes to healthcare. And uh, of course my opponent is a leader in that Congress. Nevertheless, I call it a dismal record in accomplishing anything meaningful to improve access or to improve healthcare costs which is the number one issue people talk to me about literally wherever I go in the district. Um, it appears that this current Congress has come a little hung up negotiating between two wings of their own party instead of working in a bipartisan way to achieve progress and not holding the administration accountable when it needs to be. And with respect specifically, I would say to the to the lawsuit moving forward that would undermine parts of the Affordable Care Act and potentially result in rollbacks of protections for people with pre-existing conditions. If Congress really believes in protecting people with pre-existing conditions, they need to step forward and create um, policies that make that happen. And I will tell you that my opponent and I have stark contrasts in our voting records on health care. As I said, I voted to extend protections for people with pre-existing conditions, and that is 283,000 non-elderly people in Eastern Washington, fully half of the non-elderly population, it's estimated, has a pre-existing condition. Uh, she voted against it at both the state level and at the federal level. 
We voted to create and expand children's health and to expand Medicaid to the maximum uh, ability to partner with the federal government. And she voted against the CHIP program at the state level and again at the federal level. Has supported work requirements for food stamps and Medicaid for quote unquote able-bodied people. I think that's an obsolete concept that needs to be explained to constituents, especially those in the high unemployment counties of Northeast Washington. I support family planning and that women should make the pre reproductive choices concerning their bodies, not the federal government. And I oppose the restrictions that the Trump administration has put forward that would restrict funding to Title X clinics if healthcare providers discuss all the legal options with women that they have. She wrote a letter supporting that Title X, quote unquote, gag rule, and has called for the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Uh, I believe the vote on the uh, American Healthcare Act was very damaging for Eastern Washington. It was opposed by rural and urban hospitals the Chamber of Commerce, patient organizations. Literally, I've not found anybody in Eastern Washington who supported that bill. And despite the fact that was communicated, she voted for it anyway. So what would I like to work on in Congress? I believe we need to shore up and improve uh, the ACA, not dismantle it. Uh, that would. Uh, involve some of the solutions Senator Murray has been working on in a bipartisan way and certainly means we have to shore up reinsurance opportunities so that we don't end up with people uh, reaching those untenable costs that can't be spread across a larger population. I want to expand and strengthen Medicare, not voucher it, as my opponent has voted for and ideally creating it as a public option that all can participate in. I'd like to use the market power of the federal government and appropriate regulation to bring about lower prescription drug costs while strengthening our investments in health science and public health research. We have these gems of universities here in Washington State, University of Washington, Washington State University, regionally here, Eastern Washington University, that can uh, help us move forward uh, with their research, both policy research and fundamental science research. And we are falling behind internationally in our research. So it's not enough to say we're spending more. We need to look at where we really are internationally, and we need to get that up to speed, and we will, benef we will all benefit from it. We need to go all in on healthcare workforce development. As our campus here in the university district shows, uh, doubling down on team-based care, student loan forgiveness for service up to underserved areas, you know, particularly rural areas, the teaching health center that we were able to uh, put together here to expand residencies. I just want to point out that that community-based residency program was part of the Affordable Care Act. And we were able here uh, to put together the coalition between the Empire Health Foundation and Providence Health and Services and WSU to apply for those funds and do that expanded uh, residency program development with uh, support of the University of Washington and Washington State University. And we will all benefit if we continue to work in investments that expand the healthcare workforce for all. We've got to pursue value-based purchasing strategies and look at outcomes, not just inputs into the system. And as my friend and successor at the state level, Andy Billig says, always go as upstream as we can which often means going as young as we can in providing appropriate services. And we will get the maximum from an economic perspective uh, return on our investment if we do that. We had some interesting times in the legislature where we took some innovative practices in criminal justice 
and we funneled some of the savings back into the system. And it would be great if we would start to do some of the same things with respect to health care. We clearly have some major issues facing the country that might be barriers to that, not just the health care uh, divide and logjam that we've been experiencing for years, but also the fiscal situation that the federal government is facing right now. The, uh, the tax bill and fiscal policies this year have resulted in an unprecedented expansion of national debt, $850 billion, and it's sort of setting us up for these proposals like work requirements or, grant, or block granting Medicaid, um, uh, vouchering Medicare, and other types of cuts to the social safety net programs. So I certainly don't think any of this is easy, but I think if we have our priorities straight, we could have stronger fiscal policies as well as better health care. And I'd love to see an opportunity for Washington State's uh, innovations in health care policy to continue to be reflected in federal policies in Washington, D.C. Thank you all for being here, and I look forward to maybe sharing a couple of comments or questions with DJ. All right, thank you, Lisa. So uh, let me ask sort of this, this personal question first. You've obviously campaigned a lot, a lot of different uh, years, and a lot of different cycles. How, what, what is different and what is surprising about campaigning for Congress? Uh, uh, good question. Well, the district is so much larger geographically and population wise, but the fundamentals are actually pretty similar. The, the most uh, benefit comes from direct voter contact. And so we have been literally all over Walla Walla to Republic. And I find that the more it can be unstructured and people can just walk up and express their opinion, the better it is. I start uh, the town halls by having people make statements to me about what their top concern is. We spend about 20 minutes with neighbors hearing from neighbors. And that is a really good way to get people used to the concept that we don't all agree with each other, but also to understand what people in their own neighborhood think. We've also done what we call Lemonade with Lisa in parks. And that's been really successful because people can walk up with their dogs and their kids in strollers. And that's been a really great way to find out what's on people's minds. Yeah, good. Some of the public polling shows that healthcare is a top tier issue, but that it's maybe more of a top tier issue with Democrats, independents, and less so with Republicans. Are you seeing that partisan divide on health care? Is that something that Democrats care more about than Republicans among the myriad issues that are out there? Well, interestingly, it's a little hard for me to say. I mean, uh, because when we're knocking on doors, I'm not looking at the partisan score of the person that I'm yeah. knocking on purposefully because I want to hear what is on their mind. So I'd have to go back and sort of, look. I'm sure we could figure that out, yeah. but I, I will say that uh, healthcare, especially a year ago, was really the number one thing that people talked about. And as the year has progressed, there are more people talking about just wanting independent voices and in Congress and wanting uh, accountability when the administration's going the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. and, and that's starting to become the more significant issue that, that people bring up at the door. There, you know, um, there are mixed reviews about this president. I don't know if you picked up on that. Um, Congress doesn't seem to be working very well. It doesn't seem to be working regardless of president. It's been some years since it seems to have worked well. It doesn't seem very capable of passing just straight appropriations bills. Um, it, it also has a mixed record of oversight, vis-a-vis um, -vis this administration in particular. There are some Democrats that are chomping at the bit nationally to bring investigations and subpoena uh, agencies to provide some of that oversight. 
what kind of a member of Congress would you be, given your track record in Olympia? How would you approach this question of congressional authority for of oversight? Uh, there are issues related to the kids at the border that could probably mm -hmm. use a little looking at and, and other trade issues. How would you approach that issue generally? Well, keep in mind, I also stepped away uh, from the legislature and spent five years um, working as chancellor at WSU Spokane and also embarked on a big project to help get the new medical school off the ground and, and to build bipartisan support for the campus, whether it was for nursing, pharmacy, uh, or medicine. And uh, so that was a good experience for me to be on the other side of the equation in terms of wanting to help make policy and budget uh, appropriations happen. As, as a consequence of that and the time I've had to reflect, I would definitely want to create a, co a bipartisan coalition of people to work together. And I wouldn't be creating it. It's already there. I know it's there. I've talked to members of Congress uh, who are meeting together regularly, who do come up with solutions that can get votes on both sides of the aisle. It's really a question of leadership right now, not bringing that forward. And I'll just say, not necessarily um, just leadership on one side of the aisle is responsible for that, that trend over time, but it's now something that has become almost so much the pattern that we forget that it didn't always it didn't always work that way, and it doesn't have to work that way. And so now we've got to get back to proving that it can work uh, a different way. And n nothing drives that home more than healthcare policy, but here in Eastern Washington, I would say also agricultural policy, um, because we are so dependent uh, on trade and agriculture uh, to, to really as a foundational part of the economy here, and we've got some very negative uh, trends happening there as well, where for the first time in, that anybody can remember, uh, the Farm Bill also passed in a, only a partisan way in the House. And um, so it's now starting to even get into areas of governing that it, it didn't affect before. And we've, we've got to turn it around, and you turn it around by showing success uh, uh, with um, and that requires people in, in all caucuses and both houses to, uh, to come together and make that happen. It might require challenging the administration when they're threatening a veto. You might need to say, we don't care, we need a Clean Dream Act anyway, and see what happens then. And this president has been known to change his mind a time or two. And so I would like to see a Congress that really uh, stands up, uh, makes some clear-cut statements with respect to some of these issues, and then will address the consequences when and if they occur. What, uh, are you seeing the impacts of tariffs manifest in a changing uh, mood in the electorate? You know, people saying, you know, I used to, I'm a farmer, fifth generation farmer, voted for President Trump, but these tariffs are gonna really kill us and therefore I'm changing my view? Uh, it's less about asking people how they're gonna vote, it's more about understanding where they think we need to go from here. And they clearly think we're on the wrong path. Mm -hmm. And um, these relationships took, took years or sometimes decades to build and they can be wiped out overnight. And in general, uh, people are pretty pragmatic, they want, to see us work with our neighbors and not take a go it alone approach with respect to uh, international policies. Yeah. So I heard you say that uh, if elected and if there's a Democratic majority, you'd support some sort of maybe a Medicare buy-in or uh, some sort of expansion of that to others. A lot of talk about Medicare for all or single payer models. Um, I don't think anybody really agrees on what single payer means. There's a hundred different options for that. Uh, do you think that there's enough verb and momentum in the Democratic caucus, given all of that talk, to, to do even a Medicare buy-in model? I mean, I know you're not in that caucus yet, but what are your thoughts there? It's a little hard for me to judge, and we'll have a better sense of where we're at after November, obviously. But I think that I'm talking to business owners in eastern Washington who would love the idea of uh, a uh, plan they could buy into and 
uh, relieve the burden of the uncertainty and the continual administrative costs of addressing uh, providing health care to their employees. They want to provide health care. They want to participate. It's also challenging if we think we're going to interfere with um, the different health care benefits that have been provided through collective bargaining because one size fits all would undoubtedly be better for some and worse for others. And so that's why I think a more voluntary option that provides a floor for both individuals and particularly small businesses is something that is economically viable because it would create a bigger and bigger pool of people uh, to be part of that uh, system, as well as more politically viable because we are pretty independent people and prefer options uh, to mandates. Some people think the highlight of their life and career is being a great mom. Some people think getting a PhD is the highlight of their career. Some no. people would be happy getting elected once or twice. Some people would be thrilled to be chancellor of a large university. Some people would be out of their minds proud to have been Senate Majority Leader. You're, you've done all of those things. Best of luck in your candidacy for the 5th Congressional District. Thank you very much for being here. Let's just give Lisa Brown candidate for the 5th Congressional District.